So we've talked about how energy has different properties and those properties provide different benefits both to organisms in nature and to human economies. So I'm a big proponent of sustainable, low carbon energy. I have solar panels on my roof. I am trying to get Minnesota to scale the amount of renewables that we have because this can be the glue between the short game and the long game that allows for a stable biosphere and proliferation of species and perhaps a wiser, more ecologically aware human culture. But the current narratives in our media are disconnected on both the optimistic and the pessimistic sides from reality. The image on the left shows Easter Island, a common example of a collapsed society in human history. The image on the right represents a clean, high-tech, Star Trek-like future. These seem to be the most common stories in the media about the energy transition we'll face this century. Because of a general energy blindness in our culture, the narratives in the media have become polarized. Either we can make an easy, seamless transition to clean, low-carbon renewables while maintaining metabolic 30-ton primate individual lifestyles, or that renewables are energy sinks and a waste of time and precious resources, and there's nothing we can do to avert an Easter Island repeat. The truth is in the middle. There exists a general energy blindness in our culture. Some of it's due to lack of energy education, but I suspect a good deal is due to a combination of people's careers depending on a certain narrative and our institutions being designed to react only to a narrative of more and growth instead of less. An informed reality on energy transitions, as you might guess by now, is a bit more complex. Let's take a look at some of the key points. Recall that fossil carbon and hydrocarbons are not different from solar energy. They are solar energy stored from hundreds of millions of years of sunshine by plants and animals which lived long ago. But as previously discussed, their special attributes of density, storability, transportability, and high surplus have supported our current unique and energy-intensive lifestyles. We've just gone through a 150-year period of going from 100% renewables down to 5 or 10% renewables, and now we have to gradually, but inevitably, make that transition back. This energy transition will present many constraints and opportunities, enough to fill many hours of video, but let's look at some of the core issues relevant to the upcoming energy transition. Point number one, we can now make devices that channel and concentrate usable flows of energy from the sun. We refer to this collectively as renewable energy. This technology is now mature, has gotten affordable, and can generate a great deal of low carbon energy. Renewable technologies include solar panels, wind power, wave power, geothermal, fission power, fusion power, not yet workable, and hydroelectric. But except for some ancient water and wind powered grain mills and small dams, none of these technologies have ever been built in any other way than with burning coal, oil, and gas. So let's be clear, solar panels and wind turbines tap continual flows from the wind and sun using mechanisms which need to be repeatedly rebuilt using materials, energy, and infrastructure. The mechanisms themselves are no more renewable than a pickup truck. Renewable energy tech is at this point just one more thing we do with fossil energy, along with racetracks, Disneyland, high-def TVs, disposable forks, etc. Renewable energy is therefore misnamed. It's a phrase, a meme, a story because it implies that its energy may be renewed and used again. This is not the case. An oak tree is renewable. A chicken is renewable. They can reproduce themselves based on solar and hydrological flows and finding another chicken. A Prius or a wind tower aren't renewable. They're rebuildable. Point number two, there's a mismatch between the timing of stochastic renewable flows and the current 24-7 access to energy services our societies require. The above graph is electricity consumption for the country of Germany for September of 2017. The maroon spikes of the demand for electricity from the totality of German consumers, also called humans. The yellow spikes are the total electricity generated via solar panels. The blue spikes are the electricity generated from wind. On many days, solar and wind were only a fraction of the energy demanded, so there needed to either be batteries or fossil or nuclear backup generation to make up the difference. 
On some days, not shown here, there was so much sun and wind that it overwhelmed the amount of demand and had to be curtailed or thrown away, or it would risk damaging the fragile electric grid. There is an inherent mismatch between the demanding of 24-7 access to energy and the timing and scale of what the sun can provide. Our current culture expects baseload power, higher in the daytime, lower in the nighttime, but always available to fit our wants and needs. That means either that photovoltaics and wind can only be a fairly small percent of the total power generation, or that extra mechanisms must be built to even out the flow, that batteries of some sort must store the energy for night use, or that the amount of photovoltaics must be greatly overbuilt so that it provides enough even when the clouds roll in. The higher percent of solar wind in a system, the more complex and expensive it will become if, and this is an important if, base load is what we want to maintain. A small side note here, I'm working with some regions that are trying to go 100% renewable on an accelerated time frame. And we look and there are periods of sometimes 10 or 15 or 20 days with no sun or wind. I ask them, well, what is your plan in that scenario? And they say, we'll buy from the greater grid. And I said, well, what happens if everyone wants to go 100% renewables and they all want to buy from the grid, which has coal and natural gas? And then there won't be enough available. And they're like, well, we're, we're looking into that. So these are important issues that are being worked on, but there's no easy answers. Furthermore, we frequently see in the media that a new solar installation somewhere was cheaper than coal or gas. This is highly misleading for many reasons, but mainly because a solar kilowatt hour comes when it comes. A grid-based kilowatt hour is available when you flick a switch in your house or your factory. As an analogy, it's like a restaurant advertising cheap hamburgers for 7 bucks, but only on three days a week between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., and it's closed on all the others and when it's raining, versus a place that's open 24-7 where the burger costs $9. So comparing the cost of adding solar photovoltaic to a city or a county to the overall cost of electricity for that area is kind of like apples and oranges. Point number three, fossil fuel range extenders. We're currently inundated with stories about the feasibility of 50%, 80%, or even 100% renewables powering society in 2050. While in reality, each year of the past decade, we've consumed more additional energy via fossil fuels than from renewables globally. If you look at the above graph, on a percentage basis, renewables are growing very rapidly on the right, but on an absolute total basis, there's still a small fraction of the total fossil generation. Of the last 10 years, it's 75% of additional new capacity is fossil-based. So there's a societal mechanism to make solar panels since that increases GDP but there's no such mechanism to stop using coal. What does happen though is with the scaling of renewables is when the sun shines and the wind blows, some coal and gas invariably is saved from being burned. Yet there has been no detectable down ratchet in fossil energy use as renewables have been added. In the absence of a new cultural metric that displaces GDP, Modern renewables will thus largely function as fossil fuel range extenders. This is ironic because efforts to decouple via green energy are just adding to energy burning GDP. Point number four, transportation. Our cultural energy blindness meant we naively assumed that cheap oil and gas would last forever or have easy substitutes. So we built our infrastructure around convenience, meaning millions of end nodes using individual cars and trucks driving several very short trips with relatively little cargo. This system has also allowed for the nearly instantaneous transportation of goods, so perishable stuff from around the world can arrive at locations around the world via FedEx and Amazon. A few summary points here. Nearly 100% of final destination transport in the U.S. is by trucks, which have no easy, cheap, renewable energy solution. If the goal of a system were to reduce energy or not rely on oil, Rail would be the preferred transport method, as it's 10 times more efficient steel on steel than rubber on concrete, and ships via waterways would even be more efficient. And I should point out, we already have the technology to make quote-unquote low-carbon 
fossil fuel replacements if we turn our excess electricity from large solar and wind installations into heavy fuels via electrolysis and methanol and other ways. But doing so would cost like 10 or $12 a gallon today. So the market won't choose to go that route. But this is yet another example of we have enough, but not enough to continue current societal expectations. In short, all this transportation infrastructure is going to be difficult to change and poses perhaps the key challenge to the energy and economic transition. A quick note on nuclear. Leaving aside the risk from its waste streams for the moment, nuclear does have a reasonably large surplus, and after the initial concrete expenditure, churns out a lot of low-carbon electricity for many decades. Is it a high enough energy surplus to power a civilization? Probably so. High enough to power our current civilization by itself? Highly unlikely. To make a dent in humanity's CO2 emissions, we would have to embark on a massive project of building thousands of fission plants immediately at the same time closing coal plants. There's not even a hint of that happening, and it takes a long time to build such plants, but it's possible. Okay, so those were a few of the points. Let's widen out and look at the context. Over the past 500 years, we've completely altered our energy system. We've added more and more resources, which give increasing benefits to societies. We went from firewood to wind to water mills, and then with the Industrial Revolution, rapidly added more technologies. Two fundamental characteristics underpinned this era. Our entire energy system increased in complexity, particularly with the introduction of electricity. The things we could do via this energy carrier, created with lots of fancy components, became more and more fun and attractive and a new baseline for our consumption. Additionally, we had a major increase in energy quality during the past few centuries. Firewood and windmills were low quality resources, while fossil fuels presented very favorable qualities of high density, low footprint, storability, and portability. So the future is likely going to be a combination of these two trends. As fossil fuels deplete, we're gonna have no choice but to go back down to lower quality resources as measured by less portability, lower density per unit, more land area needed, etc. Additionally, under the default trajectory, we're going to continue the trend of higher energy complexity, which includes more moving parts and components, which carries additional risks. So let me go back to this graphic and kind of illustrate conceptually what we're talking about. Our societies are now growth constrained. We're doing everything we can to kick the can of growth forward. Using financial alchemy, we're now using the black line, money creation, monetary rules, to temporarily extend the red line of non-renewable fossil stocks of energy and materials, but this can't last for much longer. However, and not surprisingly, most renewable energy forecasts continue with the same flawed assumption of a money-in, energy-out system, as opposed to an energy and materials-in, energy and materials-out system. Continue forecasting increases in the size and scale of our economy even higher than the peak of non-renewable material stocks, particularly energy, to support them. To be honest, the story I'm telling here is not a popular story, particularly among leaders and billionaires in the media, even at universities. But in my opinion, we would be wise to consider our ingenuity and technology and remaining fossil energy as seed corn to pave a way forward, a lower total throughput, which combines our non-renewables with stochastic technology harvesting the daily flows of the sun. Lots of people are working on sustainability, but largely without this energy context. What level the combination of technology and non-renewable resources would be achievable, given the constraints outlined in this video series, is an urgent question. Almost by definition, it can't be maintained at the top of wherever the peak in non-renewable resources eventually will be. What fraction of that consumption could be roughly maintained with technology and different social and cultural living arrangements? It's perhaps a question you'll help to research and work towards. Solar PV and other energy tech could play a large part in powering a very nice human civilization but not this civilization, not the way we've structured it now. In coming decades, we face an enormous task, shifting our human energy system back from the one-time bounty of fossil energy to what it always was before, 
the cumbersome harvesting of low density and erratic solar flows to meet our needs. We can have a happy, meaningful, and productive society using a high percentage of renewables in tandem with probably less overall energy. But this is not generally what's being promised and promoted. We'll all have to understand and adapt to these circumstances. We're going to have to work more when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. We're going to have to gradually or not so gradually give up 24-7 access to as much exosomatic energy as we want to use. The good news is this is both physically possible and psychologically perhaps not as much of a hardship as we might believe. Let's take a quick look at the relationship between energy and happiness.